thoughts in your mind. I heard somebody talk about this one time. This might be something that we ought to look into a little bit more. I think Michael was nice enough to put on the table copies of an article that I did for the St. Louis Bar Journal a couple years ago on shop drawings and submittals and all that. But that is basically what this talk is going to be. There should be a, a copy for everybody there. So let's get into the topic and uh, see what we're gonna find out tonight. Um, you can't really talk about every contractual scenario that exists in the construction industry. So what we're gonna start out with is talking about under the AIA documents, because they're so common, so popular, and used so much, uh, what are what is the role of submittals and shop drawings and that kind of thing? And if you look at the documents, you look at the contract documents, they are defined in the contract documents as being how the contractor proposes to conform to the information given and the design concept expressed in the contractor documents for those portions of the work requiring submittals. Uh, and it is important to remember what the function of submittals are. The function is to, uh, can be sometimes something as simple as just simply an administrative process, uh, submitting the operating manual or a training manual for equipment that's on the site, or it can be something more important like the contractor being of communicating what he intends to construct on the project or what he may have been delegated to design under the contract and how he intends to meet that design concept. Um, it, when, uh, when the design concept is delegated to the contractor, submittals play a much different role than they do typically because it is rare, though we all know it happens a lot, that design is delegated to someone other than the lead design professional. And if the contractor needs to do that work, there is a natural tension between the design professional on the project and the contractor's designer. And the role that the submittals will play will help communicate to the lead designer what the intention is to be done and how you can figure out exactly what it is that's gonna end up on your project as you've designed it. Equally important though is remembering what submittals are not. Submittals are not part of the work. The work is very defined in the contract documents in the AIA contract documents. The contractor's obligation is to execute the work described in the contract documents and they define what those contract documents are. The drawings, the specifications, the contractual agreement, the general conditions, etc. The noticeable absence from the list you'll see in the AIA documents are submittals and shop drawings because they are specifically excluded under the contract documents. So why is that important? Why do, why do we care that that's what it says? When a contractor signs an, uh, an agreement with the owner to perform the work, that's his obligation. His obligation isn't set out on the submittals and the shop drawings that are sent along as the project goes forward. So you've got to keep in your mind as you're analyzing this and going through the project, don't get hung up thinking, well, if that's where you submit it, that's what the work is. Because it isn't. You have to continually go back to the design and from a legal perspective, keep it on the straight and narrow and make sure that they're doing what the work is. When you're talking about submittals under the AIA, the contractor's obligation is significantly more than the uh, designer's obligation. The contractor has to prepare the shop drawings, which could be drawings, diagrams, schedules, and I know you know all this, but prepared by a contractor or a subcontractor or a supplier to illustrate some portion of the work. 
they provide that illustration so the design professional and the design professional's client, the owner, knows they're getting what was specified. It's a way of communicating on the project to make sure that the contractor is going to deliver what he promised he would deliver when he signed the contract document. When the contractor sends in his submittals, first of all, it's an affirmative representation by the contractor that he reviewed these submittals for compliance with the contract documents, that he approved these submittals before he submitted them to the design professional. And why is that important? And he also has to uh, com either comply with the schedule in the contract or in a reasonable amount of time. But why is this review and approval important? It's, a, it's a, maybe a little belt and suspenders, but it's an affirmative representation by the contractor that I understand what your design is telling me to do, and that's what I'm going to do on this project. Not only did I sign a contract that said I'm going to do that, but I've worked through it, and here's my communication setting that out. This is what I'm going to do. <coughs> that review and approval includes verifying the materials that are included. And when I say verify, I mean verifying that it's in, it is in keeping with the plans and specifications, that there are f appropriate field measures were taken and it will work. The pieces will all go together in the language of a political science major. The pieces will all go together. That they looked at the field and this works with the field criteria or there's a reasonable <laughs> belief that it will and they've checked on the uh, other portion of the contract requirements, and this is coordinated with those other portions of the contract requirements. Mr. Berg. Take, take him first. Okay, sir. Uh, let me, I, let, before, I want to hear your question, but if you have a question, raise your hand and ask a question. Don't wait to the end or break. Yes. Can I, I get the impression that this is a design bid build model that you're talking about? The traditional about? design to build model. Okay. Right. That is what I'm talking about. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What happens if the, or the architect receives a set of shop drawings from the contractor that has not been approved by the contractor? What should happen? Send it back. Okay. Send it back. And it, okay, that was a pretty uh, quick trigger answer. Let me right. take a step back. <laughs> if your contract your client's contract with a contractor requires, like the AIA does, that he review and approve them before he submits them to you, and he doesn't send them back. Because otherwise, if you accept it, are you waiving the requirements of the contract now on behalf of your client? And if you get into a gray area, there's no reason to get into the gray area. But architects don't approve the yeah. You know, uh, wait, wait, you the answer? <laughs> <laughs> somebody, somebody, somebody in this room sent me an email earlier this week and, and kind of asked the same question. And it really depends on what you do. It's not so much the work. Okay, you, you have to look at the substance of how you dealt with it, what the con, what your duty is under the contract, what your professional duties are under the contract. It isn't so simple as, and I can remind, I'm, I'm old enough, and I know I didn't have to say that, but I'm old enough to remember when they used to have that approved stamp on shop drawings, right? And then everybody got really smart and said, oh, we're not approved, we're just reviewing them. But really, you know, what's the difference? I mean, at the end of the day, really, what is the difference? So you're saying the contractor's approving them, sending them to the architect, the architect then is reviewing them, yes. marking them, and then approving them, yes. and sending them back to... If your contract. approval is within the scope of what you're required to do in the contract, what you call it, what you call it review or approval, doesn't make any difference. It's all going to come back to, what is my obligation under the contract? Did I agree with my 
with the owner client that I would look at these and double check everything the contractor is doing. First of all, let me say, God, I hope not. But if you did, you know, that's one thing. But if you're saying, I'm going to review these for general conformance with the design and what's called for in the plans and specifications, and you say, yeah, I looked at this and I approve it as conforming with the general concept of the design. Legally, what terms it make you call it review or approval? As long as you're staying within the confines of your contract. Okay. Does that, yeah. whether you're calling it review or approval, apply as well to the contractor? Because what I see and I've seen is that our front end will say the contractor must stamp it approved for construction. But what all of them do is stamp it, well, their, their, their assistant stamps it reviewed. Right. And do, is that something we should push that they actually state what the front end says? You, 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 I'm going to give you a lawyer answer first. Okay. Yes. Okay. That's their obligation. They, they are in a much different position than you are because of the obligations they have. Because they have to go out and build it. Mm -hmm. So they really should be approving what they're going to build. Otherwise, what are they really telling you? They're not telling you much of anything, right? right. The non-lawyer answer is, I know in the real world that's a difficult situation and you're going to get a lot of pushback on it. Yeah. But to the extent that you could require it, you ought to require it. <clears throat> right? But I will say the same thing for contractors that I told this gentleman about designers. Really, it's the substance of what you do and not what they call it so much, okay. right? Yep. So uh, that's the difference. And I will say the contractors learned the knee of the master. You know, you guys all said, I'm going to take a step back. <laughs> they went, that's a great idea. I'm going to take a step back. So, yeah. so not, not to bombard you, but I warned you this was going to That's happen. okay. That's fine. I don't mind. Really. <clears throat> um, as so exciting when it, as this is, I can when it comes down when it comes down to it, right? I don't. I as an architect do not have a contract with the contractor. In in the traditional and, design bid build. Right. And in enforcing the contractor's terms in their agreement with the owner, I have no real leverage. I can point out to the owner that procedures aren't being followed and that there's a potential liability, you know, exposure there for the owner. But at the end of the day. If the owner doesn't make the contractor do what's in their contract, I don't have a lot to say about it. Okay, let's let first let's limit this to, to shop drawings. Mm -hmm. So we've got supplements on what we're talking about. Absolutely. And in that instance, you do have some leverage because the contract says they can't do the work until they have an approved shop drawing. If a shop drawing is required for that scope of work, A. B. The contract requires the contractor to approve the shop drawings and in the process of approving, telling you all this stuff. Oh yeah. Right? So if he sends you a shop drawing and he hasn't approved it, what are you doing when you say, yeah, it's okay, even though you didn't approve it and you're required to it, under the contract? It now you're putting your client at risk i.e. you're putting yourself at risk. It frequently happens that on some small projects in some parts of St. Charles County, <coughs> um, the owner has a much closer and more trusting relationship with the contractor than they do with their architect. Um, so whether I, whether I mark them uh, rejected or approved as noted is, is sometimes ignored. Right. And at that point, but what do you think? We, all, we all know what a CYA letter is, right? Yeah. You know, and probably today it's a CYA email. Yeah. But you, you can't, you know, it's what I was saying to Catherine, at a certain point, reality sets in and you can't hold a gun to somebody's head. Yeah. If you're in that predicament, and it can be very polite and understated, but say, you know, he didn't do this right, and I told him it wasn't approved, and he's still doing the work, and you, you know, we talked about it, and you said, that's okay, don't make an issue out of it. But my insurance company wants me to write this email, or, you know, my lawyer wants me to, you know, 
You throw the lawyer under the bus. That's part of what you get is the package of throwing the lawyers under the bus. Right? So, but it, you know what you need to do if you're in that predicament is is protect yourself, and it doesn't have to be antagonistic or argumentative. You just need to protect yourself. Thank you. So, is, is it the way to, to deal with that to write a non conforming work letter and the owner can choose to accept non conforming work? And you've done what you're supposed to do with the contract, and the owner can <coughs> yeah. elect not to, not to follow what, what you said. You're, you're saying they already went ahead and did it. <coughs> right, right. It's not right. Been done. You, write, you write a non conforming work right. letter, and then you're. And then they, they either, the owner signs off on it. Right. Or they figure it out, but you've done what you can do. Absolutely, right. <clears throat> My company's stone drawings, shop drawings are a work of art. But the what the, the supply I like to see is you know revise and resubmit because I know that somebody's looked at them. <clears throat> Have they then bought the approval of that drawing? <coughs> you know, the contractor. I'm sorry, I, I lost. The train your question. Can you ask me again, please? I mean, when the architect marks it, revise and resubmit, have they then superseded the, the contractor's approval or no? Uh, again, it depends on your contract, but if we're talking about the AIA, no. <laughs> they haven't. Your the contractor is still responsible. And, if we get further into the presentation, there, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, now, if, if, if under the AIA structure, okay, if the contractor submits a shop drawing that doesn't conform with the, the design, with the plans and specifications, and the designer says, I reviewed it, it's okay, and sends it back, and misses the non-conformance, under the contract, the contractor is still responsible to comply with the plans and specifications and the missed deviation in the shop drawings does not excuse his performance. I think that's what you're asking, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's why I said no. Should I try to slide? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all, I know is, all I know is we send them to the contractor and they go boom. <laughs> yeah. yeah. On their way. Yeah. There is a there is a case I'm going to uh, talk about a little bit further into this presentation. Are you a subcontractor? I take it or supplier? Supplier. supplier. This was it was a fight between a supplier and a subcontractor. And uh, I can talk about this now, we'll just get the slide and get to it. And, and the sub kept sending the shop drawings to the contractor, showing more work, a bigger scope of work, and, and it was either tile or granite installation, I can't remember, than what was shown <coughs> on his contract, what he agreed he would do. And the contractor kept saying, that's great, and pass it on to the owner, that's great, pass it on the owner. The sub did all this work, and they said, well, you owe me extra money because I did more work than shown on the contract. And the contractor goes, oh, no. Uh, no, you, got, you live and die by the contract. The shop drawings essentially aren't going to get you extra dollars. And in that case, the Court of Appeals in Missouri said, you got several sets of these drawings. You looked at them. He, you, you approved them and sent them on. you got to pay this guy for doing that work. So, you know, there, there isn't a real bright line on some of this stuff. So in some circumstances, if the contractor is saying this is all, you know, rainbows and unicorns and let's keep going, at the end of the day, even if the owner says, I'm not paying the contractor, the contractor may need to pay you, right? Hopefully, that's the idea, to get paid, right? <laughs> Okay. <coughs> this actually is uh, something I just touched on. Until the con until the architect approves under the AAA family or actually approves the uh, shop drawings, the contractor is prohibited from doing the work. 
and I say prohibited in kind of a theoretical sense because you can't, you know, you're not going to go out there and stand between him and the foundation wall and not let him do it, right? But what if he does do it, he's doing it at his own risk. And that, so you don't have to, if he's not doing it right, you're kind of off the hook, even though uh, you may be out there looking at it. And this is the part I, I just uh, talked about. Even if the architect approves a shop drawing that includes a deviation from the contract documents, the contractor still has to perform in accord with the contract documents. Now there is an exception for intentional deviations. Contractors who are, you know, they're just as smart as the rest of us sometimes look at these things and go, <coughs> I think there's a better way to do this and submits a shop drawing that is essentially a suggestion that something different be done than what's called for in the design. If the architect gives <coughs> written approval to it, and by written approval I mean either a change directive or a change order, the contractor's good to go. But if the architect just looks at the shop drawing and says, I, re I, I reviewed it, you're good to go, or even says, I approved it, that doesn't alleviate the contractor from, from still conforming with the original plans and specifications. If he wants to go that alternative route that he suggested in the submittal, he's got to go back to the architect and go, all right, you approve this, this isn't what's in the plan, I need a change order, or I need some kind of uh, written <coughs> justification for what's going on here. If I interrupt. Sure. I believe the language in the document say that the contractor has to notify the architect of the deviation. Right. And the architect then is providing written approval. You're absolutely right. It, do, it does say he's required to put the architect on notice that it is different than what's called for in the plan specifications. Which is different than just getting it wrong. Because sometimes you get a deviation that's just wrong. This is by intent. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> Okay, let's talk a little bit about um, the architect's obligations. Uh, then we'll get into some a little bit of case law here. It is much more limited uh, compared to what the contractor uh, contractor's obligations are. And this is the language you always hear. You're only looking for conformance with information in the contract documents and the design concept. So it doesn't put you under the obligation of looking at it in great detail. Um, the language in the AIA, let me back up a little bit here. The language in the AIA contract actually has uh, an exclusion that specifically says it excludes obligations on the part of the design professional for accuracy and completeness of details such as dimensions and quantities or installation instructions or equipment performance. Those all remain the obligation of the contractor. No discussion of, uh, of shop drawings would be complete without talking about Duncan versus Missouri Board of Architects and Engineers. And I know this <coughs> is a group I probably don't have to say much about. The Hyatt Regency Skywalk collapse that occurred back in 1981. Um, there were 114 deaths and 186 other injuries as a result of that. And I suspect most of you know this, and not to try to play architect <coughs> engineer here, but this is, uh, this is a skywalk on the second floor in the lobby of the Hyatt Regency in Kansas City. This is a skywalk on the fourth floor of the Hyatt Regency of Kansas City. This over here is the skywalk for the third floor. Uh, in July of 1981, shortly, relatively shortly after the building was finished, these two skywalks collapsed when there was a tea dance going on in the lobby of the hotel. And that's how you ended up with the incredible number of deaths and the incredible number of injuries that you had. This is the way the engineer designed 
the support for these skywalks. This is a rod, one continuous long rod that you can see here in the uh, renderings. This is the deck that went through this box and held up this deck, held up this deck in part by this support, right? And I'm sure there's people here that know more about this than I do, and if you want to, if I get it wrong, I feel free to correct me, but this is my understanding of what happened. This is the lobby of the hotel after the collapse. This is the fourth floor deck. This is part of the second floor deck that fell um, I think I already mentioned it fell during the uh, during this tea dance. Um, there was a, a lawyer in St. Louis <coughs> by the name of Don James, uh, who uh, was kind of my mentor when I was coming up in the profession. And uh, when and I was only out of law school a few years when this happened, but Don got a call. <coughs> to represent the engineering company that did the design for the Skywalk. It happened on a Friday night. He got called on Saturday at home and said, there's been this terrible tragedy. Can you get out to Kansas City as fast as you can and <coughs> do whatever you need to do? And, you know, we want you to represent the engineering firm, blah, blah, blah. <coughs> Don was a, uh, a Korea War medic, so he had seen some things over his life. <clears throat> he went out there and he came back. It took him about a week to recover from what he saw because he said to get people out from underneath these skywalks, they took chainsaws <coughs> and were cutting off limbs so they could get them out because if they left them there, they would die. <clears throat> the other thing he told me that really uh, stuck with me is he said this floor in the lobby was carpeted. And he said, have you ever walked on a wreck on a wet carpet? And, well, you know, sure. He goes, you know how you step and the water comes out? He goes, I walked across that carpet and blood came up out of the carpet like water <coughs> in the carpet. This was just a, a horrendous disaster. <coughs> but there is almost every discussion of shop drawings, not only in Missouri, which is obviously where this happened in Kansas City, but across the country, touches on this case. There have been thousands of presentations on this case. Um, I can't explain all the details to you, and I'm not going to pretend that I can, but I can tell you this. <coughs> I told you they called for, this is the original design, right? They called for this one continuous uh, rod to hold up the skywalks because of fabrication problems, and I can't tell you what they are, the fabricator couldn't make this long rod. So he, he said, well, let's do it this way and have one rod come down to the fourth floor and then we'll start another rod here and have that come down like that. So instead of having the one long rod, you have these two rods. Forces that I uh, am not going to even <coughs> explain to you are significantly different because you have this two rod twisting on this connection as opposed to one long rod. And that's what the shop drawing showed that was submitted to the engineer, <coughs> this two rod connection. <coughs> so those, that was submitted to uh, Dan Duncan was the name of the engineer <clears throat> whose seal was on everything. It was uh, John Gillum's firm, was the engineering firm. So we ended up, not surprisingly, having a licensing disciplinary action. And that's what this opinion arises out of, is the disciplinary action against Dan Duncan. <clears throat> At the hearing level, the uh, board decided that he deserved to be uh, disciplined, and the discipline was they were going to pull, they pulled his license because of what he did, and they said he, his conduct was gross negligence in failing to review these shop drawings properly. 
uh, the disciplinary board found <coughs> that he didn't review the shop drawings for compliance with the Kansas City Building Code. Uh, he didn't look for conformance with the design concept as required by the structural engineer's contract. And there was uh, other information in the contract documents that he simply ignored, but he, he approved the shop drawings. And back then they were still talking about approval of shop drawings. He approved the shop drawings and sent them out, and that's why this uh, got built the way it did. Well, it went up on appeal. <coughs> to the Missouri Court of Appeals, and I, I I think probably most people know this, but I'm going to say this anyway just to make sure we're all on the same page. A trial level decision really just controls what happens between the two parties that are fighting at the trial level, right? But if it goes to the Court of Appeals and a formal opinion comes down, it's kind of, it dictates law to everybody. When, when you have facts similar to this, this is a controlling law. So this is the Court of Appeals opinion that came down <coughs> after a long hearing, and they said they found review and approval is an engineering function. The Dan Duncan's in, employer's in-house policy called for a detailed check of special connections <coughs> And this was a special connection, uh, the way the case recites this, and I think this is right, a special connection means it's non-redundant. And a non-redundant connection, if it fails, the structure comes down. There's, there's nothing that cuts the structure. I got a knot, so I must be at least close to what I'm saying, right? <laughs> okay. The thing is, it came out, it, he knew of this change. He was alerted to it. You know, we were talking a little bit earlier about when you got to give them notice or you got to tell them you're doing something different. I don't know if that's what this fell under, but there was no dispute that he knew of the change and he didn't even look at this connection to see if it was workable or safe for the people. The Court of Appeals also talked about not him not complying with the building code. It was contractually required and he didn't do it. It's universally accepted as part of the uh, design engineer's responsibility. And I think if I recall the opinion correctly, they particularly focused on that because this was a, a special connection. It wasn't just something <coughs> routine, if you will. They found his conduct showed a conscious indifference to his professional responsibilities and duties and he breached a non delegable duty by doing what he did or I guess I should say failing to do what he did and, and in my profession when we talk about non delegable uh, uh, another way to think about it is unexcusable you, you know you can't say well I just didn't get to it or you know somebody else is going to take care of it it falls on squarely on your shoulders and you're responsible for it. And the court said he just didn't do that. And he ended up <clears throat> he ended up losing his license. Now, it's a fascinating case, and it's it, it is a short the opinion is a short novel, so we you know we just hit some of the highlights of it. But I want you to, to when you leave here to take away if you remember, this is a licensing case. The only thing the court was trying to decide here is should we pull his license or not? Or actually, was the licensing board correct in pulling his license? This isn't a liability case. This isn't a finding that sets a standard for how you should review shop drawings on a given project. I think you ought to be aware of it and keep it in the back of your mind, but it is, it, it gets, Every time you're involved in a lawsuit where there's shop drawings and someone missed something on a shop drawing, you hear, <laughs> Duncan versus Board of Architects and Engineers, you guys are in a lot of trouble. Hit the brakes on the liability argument. It's not quite what you're making it out to be. The problem is convincing the court that it's not quite what they make it out to be. But it is something you, you need to be aware of. Okay, anyway. <clears throat> Let's talk about something a little uh, less distressing. In review of the shop drawings, if you're the party reviewing them, 
you have an obligation to review those drawings in good faith. There is, in uh, this is a case out of the state of Washington, so it's not a Missouri case, but uh, Missouri has the same uh, implied clause in every contract that the state of Washington has. And that is, there is an implied obligation to deal with the other party so you don't prevent or hinder or interfere with performance of the other party's ability to uh, perform the contract. In this case, is a, a great opinion on, to illustrate this point. <clears throat> Nova bid to do some work for the city of Olympia in Washington, and it was a pretty small project. It was re to replace a culvert, and it was a publicly bid project. And uh, the city engineer for the city of Olympia if you read between the lines of opinion, it doesn't say this, wanted his buddy to get the job, but the public bidding requirements caused it to go to Nova. Well, the city engineer for the city of Olympia didn't like that idea. Uh, so they had a big tussle over shop drawings. The engineer, the city, I'll just say, pointed out to a couple of things in the contract uh, one, the contract said the city engineer's approval of the shop drawing is required as a prerequisite to doing any work covered by a given submittal. And two, the city engineer's decision to accept or reject the submittal is final. In other words, you don't have to keep your done. If the city engineer says no, the answer is no, right? So, Nova started to do work on the project. They start submitting their shop drawings, and the city uh, engineer kept sending them back, rejected them, rejected them, rejected them. And Nova said, all right, we're done. We're gonna sue you because you're just doing this because you won us off the job, right? Well, before <laughs> Nova could get to court, the city terminated the contract with Nova, so uh, they ended up in a fight about whether uh, the termination was right and whether the city's conduct was appropriate. The Court of Appeals in the state of Washington recognized this implied duty of good faith <coughs> and fair dealing that I just talked about. Don't hinder or interfere or prevent someone from for, for performing the contract requires the parties to operate so each may benefit from full performance of the contract. This, and the Court of Appeals said, no, well, you win. The city said, well, wait a minute. We have unconditional authority. The contract says we can do whatever we want to do and our decision is final and you can't, uh, you can't do anything about it. And the court rejected that. And what the court said was, yes, the city has a right to reject the submittal, but the city's judgment has to be guided by whether the submittal complied with the contract. And the city has to exercise that dis discretion to approve or not approve consistent with the contract requirements, including this implied obligation of good faith and, and fair dealing. So what did, uh, there was a whole litany of examples in the case, but the, the two that kind of jumped out at me, what did the city do to show a lack of good faith? They would, they required NOVA to have all submittals approved before they would let them start any work on the project. The contract said you can't start a given section of work until the submittal's approved, so that was over and above what the uh, contract uh, permitted the city to do. The other thing is <clears throat> they would review a submittal and reject it for reason A, send it back to NOVA, they would correct reason A, resubmit it, and the city would go, yeah, A is okay, but now B and C, and they'd send it back. And they'd correct B and C and send it, and the city would go, 
Well, A, B, and C is okay, but I mean, now we see B, so now you gotta do something with D. They were, they were jerking around, right? So that was, that was uh, what the court said. No, we're not gonna let you do that. That's not how you deal with each other. Okay, let's, uh, let's shift gears a little bit. This kind of goes to something I think someone had a few questions <coughs> on earlier, and that's, <coughs> Can a submittal, approved, submitted, not approved, reviewed, can that change what the scope of the work is for a contractor? United States versus Henke Construction, a contractor claimed some additional work and his argument was, uh, you know, I've got all this additional labor and material and I showed it to you on these shop drawings that I submitted to you, United States. And the United States said, yeah, you did submit these, but we sent them back with no review, approval, nothing. We just said, be guided by the contract. So the court looked at this argument that they were making and rejected it and said the failure to approve or disapprove didn't cause the loss that the contractor suffered because the contract is what controlled not the shop drawings. Well, what if the contract does require approval of the shop drawings? And I'm gonna cut this a little bit short because this is the case I was talking about where the subcontractor submitted the shop drawings and highlighted where the granite was gonna be installed and they went through the whole rigmarole. And uh, the court, at the end of the day, said, yeah, you were submitted shop drawings, you looked at them, you passed them on, general contractor, you're obligated to the subcontractor because she showed you this work and, and in fact, you accepted it by approving the shop drawing. Now that's not, that doesn't get to the next step of the role of a design professional, but it is a, uh, I think an interesting case that gets around that. These are, this is some of the things the court found in that particular instance that the shop drawings were submitted more than once, all the, area, all the areas were highlighted. Everything that was highlighted was cut and installed. So the reasonable inference is there really wasn't a dispute. And the real interesting part of this to me is their scope of work reference details of the shop drawing. <laughs> Remember we talked about under the AIA, the AIA says shop drawing, clearly shop drawings are not part of the work. They're not included. If there's a situation where a little better contract drafting could have saved these people some real problems. Was that between the owner and the contractor? Or the this is between the sub and the general. Sub and the general, yeah, that statement. Yes, yes, it is, not in the, it is not in the owner general contract. That's what you're asking, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Timely missile review, this is a, a Missouri Court of Appeals case. I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on it uh, because it's, it's not particularly exciting, but it does make the point that if the drawing, the shop drawings or submittals aren't approved either according to the schedule in the contract or in a reasonable time. That's you know a lawyer's favorite term, well that was a reasonable period of time. Uh, that can delay the performance and if it results in a delay to the contractor, the contractor can get additional delay damages, extended overhead, <coughs> uh, standby, that kind of thing. <coughs> the Missouri, this actually went to the Missouri Supreme Court and they said there was enough evidence to support this argument that it should have gone to the jury. And what happened was at the trial level, the trial court just said, I'm not even gonna let a jury decide this, I think we're done, you lose, Mr. Contractor, because you haven't stated a claim that obligates the state to do anything on a more 
expedited basis. And the Supreme Court said, yeah, just because there isn't a set schedule, you have to act reasonably and, and respond in a reasonable time. And you did. Okay, essentially everything we've talked about up to this point has been uh, situations where the uh, parties are in contractual privity, which is uh, we can charge more, lawyers can't have they use terms like that, and that's, instead of just saying they have a contract together, so we call it contractual privity. So write that <coughs> down, and you can use that sometimes to send someone a bill and tell them, well, you're not in contractual privity with me. <coughs> This is, this is a little bit different. This is when uh, do you have liability to a third party, someone that's a stranger to the relationship uh, for something that you did in regard to the shop drawings. All right. <clears throat> Wagner versus WW Steel Company, uh, two guys were working on a construction project when a gust of wind uh, blew an unsecured and unbraced piece of, of steel uh, loose and caused it to collapse. And the trial court said essentially, well, Mr. Engineer, you looked, or architect, I can't know which one it was, I guess architect, you looked at this and at the shop drawings and talked about the structural steel and you said it was okay, so you must be liable for part of it. And they said, well, that just can't be right. So they went up on appeal and this was down in Oklahoma and uh, the court in Oklahoma looked at all the uh, contract documents and they noted that the, uh, sh uh, the contract documents provided Shop drawings were to first be submitted to the contractor for review and verification of all field measurements, field construction criteria, materials, catalog numbers, and similar data. And the contractor's approval was required on the submittal before it went to the architect. And that is, the court said, a representation that he, he the contractor, reviewed and approved these shop drawings as being in conformance with the requirements of the contract, right? Uh, the contract documents also said the contractor is solely responsible for all construction <coughs> means, methods, techniques, and sequences. The court found that the architect was obligated only to review for conformance with the design concept. Uh, I, I don't remember this case saying this was a situation where they used the AIA family of documents, but this language, as you know from what we talked about earlier, is, is virtually identical. <coughs> the court in the Wagner case concluded that it is not the duty of the architect to see that the shop drawings included temporary connections. That was encompassed in the field construction criteria, the means and methods, sequence and, and uh, procedures, and therefore the architect cannot be liable for the death of the two gentlemen that were involved in this accident, even though they approved uh, the shop drawing that dealt generally with the area where the accident took place. Uh, there are two other cases uh, here that I talk about. The block case was a, was a temporary fastening device. Uh, workers sustained a fall and had a severe head injury. The, the design professional had reviewed the shop drawings, but did, you know, the the temporary fastening devices were not included in the shop drawing, so the lawyer representing the injured party was arguing, you're a professional, you know they should be there, it wasn't there, you should be held responsible. And the court in the uh, block case, which was over across the river, over in Illinois, said, uh, no, this is all the contractor's responsibility. It's 
not what the design professional does. They only look at conformance with the design concept as a finished product, not as the project goes along. National Foundation <coughs> Company that had to do with handrails and is essentially the same logic and the same reasoning applied to uh, National Foundation that applied to the other two cases we just talked about. <coughs> now, Question. there's always, on the other hand, yes so, sir? A general catch-all phrase, means and methods is the contractor. Is there a gray area or is means and methods the contractor? There are, uh, <coughs> there are uh, literally hundreds of cases <coughs> around the country on what that means. But I think you'd find if you actually took the time to sit down and read all of them, and I haven't, though I've read a, you know, a number of them, there is a pretty clear consensus that if it isn't, if it is what you have to do to get from a barren piece of land to a finished structure, that's means and methods. What the finished structure is supposed to look like is a design professional responsibility. How they put the pieces of that jigsaw puzzle together, that's means and methods. You know, so <coughs> you know, whether you, you, you know, use elevators or lifts or whatever you do, that's up to you, but you're not gonna be able to put that on the design professional. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Okay. <coughs> Uh, <clears throat> this is a case where the approved shop drawings, which were uh, approved by HDR, uh, did not conform with the design. Now remember, this is a liability to a third party. We're not talking about <clears throat> to the owner or to the contractor. This is a person got injured. Uh, it had to do with a steel a landing that was supposed to be 10 gauge steel. The shop drawing I went through was 14 gauge steel. HDR didn't catch it. It was a mistake by the contractor. It was a mistake by HDR. The evidence at the trial was the difference in the gauges of this uh, landing is what caused the accident that injured this person. And the, uh, the court in that case, in the HDR case, said, HDR, you're responsible for this because it does deal with the design. The design was pretty specific and you missed it. <clears throat> and we have, different, we have different duties when we're talking about, uh, different legal duties when we're talking about hurting a person or killing a person accidentally or uh, are damaging someone's property than we do when we're talking about uh, someone that we have a contract with when the problem really only is did I get what I paid for under the contract uh, there is a there is a, a doctrine called the economic loss doctrine which uh, I'd have you all sleep in about five minutes if I started talking about this and we could do an all day seminar and it's a pretty important thing but it basically says when you're talking about this argument i didn't get what i paid for which is a contract dispute the contract controls the duties and responsibilities so we're not going to go outside of that so if rick and i have a contract and, and rick's contract says i'm never going to be responsible for missing anything in a shop drawing no matter how careless i am that's a gross exaggeration, and he would never do that. And I signed that contract. <laughs> <laughs> I signed that contract. The court's going to say, you know, you're essentially you're both grown ups. You went in with your eyes open. That's what you bought, right? But if I, but if a designer does something to injure a third party, that that person had, you know, has no relation to them. We all have to operate with ordinary care. When you, when you leave here and drive home, you have to drive home using ordinary care. If you hit somebody, 
because you were careless, you're responsible. That's kind of what this case says, right? That's like HDR ran over this guy with their shop drawing. It doesn't really change all the discussion we had about no responsibility for not catching mistakes by the contractor. This is different. This is a, this is in a different stadium than when you're dealing with where everybody has a contractual relationship with this guy. So the one thing we haven't touched that we have, we talked about intentional deviation before. But what if the architect was the one creating the intentional deviation by marking a shop drawing 14 gauge steel instead of 10? And they make a note on there saying, yeah, it's supposed to be 14 gauge here. Um, what about architects intentional deviations whether they did it mistakenly or on purpose to try to get additional work or a change in the contract without <coughs> issuing a change order which happens way too much <coughs> can the architect then beg off that shop drawing later when uh, okay, are you uh, all right let me just add, are you asking in this <coughs> kind of situation or in the well this is the severe one if it was just economic loss that'd be something else but yeah <coughs> in a situation where the architect goes in and he starts to scribble all over the gauge numbers on the stair landing, say. And he and changes them all like he it thinks they should be. Well, you better, get the, check, you better get the checkbook out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, you know, it, it's your design. You ought to know what's called for. And there are procedures, obviously, in the contract. If you want to change that gauge to do it, right? And you would have a procedure, don't you? Right. And if you're doing, if you, that is a case I would never take in front of a jury. Because I will tell you, juries hate people that are trying to get away with something. And that's what it sounds like to me when you're saying, I'm just going to change it. I'm not going to issue a change order or a direct, I'm just going to see if I can slide this by. And somebody ends up getting hurt, you better get your truck book out. Well, you know, it's more like you give it to a younger person in your firm, they look at something and they go in and they change a dimension. And it's a simple change, they think. Right. They think they have it figured out, but they didn't check something somewhere else. And it becomes a mistake. Well, the mistake then is on the and, shop drawing. And it becomes else. your mistake. Yeah. Is it, does it become your mistake? Yes. That's basically what I meant. It becomes your mistake if, you're on, if he's under your supervision and it becomes the firm's mistake. Which is why generally we usually tell our younger trainees, people that are coming along, don't do the contractor's redoing work for him. You have to just point out what you think is wrong and let him right. check it and see if he wants to make a change. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's a, real, it's a real fine line that you guys have to walk between directing somebody to do something and saying what you're doing is it right? Because human nature, the natural thing to do is do it this way. This would be, you know, let's make it easier for everybody. But if you happen to not be right in what you're saying, or even a lesser concern, but still a concern, it's gonna cost more money, you're gonna have a claim. Well, I was gonna do it the way the design said, but the architect, Mr. Owner, your architect told me to do it this way, so you ought to pay me X number of dollars because he changed it on me. And here's the shop drawing showing it with all its writing all over it. Now, maybe you could go to court and win that argument. I, I think you probably end up losing that argument. Maybe making some bad law and walking away, quite frankly. So, so yeah, you gotta be real careful about that. Does the contract do not have an air responsibility on this one since they saved the shop drawing? Um, no reason that it Okay, if you don't hold me to this, I'm going to give you an answer. My recollection is the contractor was already out of the case. He was in earlier and either settled or didn't go up on appeal or, or there was some reason he was not. I think he was in originally. It was only the dispute with the engineer. I think because uh, HDR thought, well, it's a shop drawing. You know, we don't have that kind of responsibility. Right? So. Kind of to your point, they created this bad law, right? Well, this opens up the big question. Why have shop drawings at all? Well, how else do you have that communication? It's in the drawings. What's I mean, what's, what's the point of a shop drawing at all? 
Well, I'll look to these guys because I didn't go to architect or engineer school. I didn't fabricate the building when I was down there. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe someone You're else. You're not doing it. fabrication. You're not asking whether you have jobs or not. You're asking whether, you're asking whether technology more than one person, the guy who's going to actually do the work, be involved in the shop drawing. Why should an architect receive the shop drawings in the first place? Yeah, I can go out on the site and say, wait a minute. I specify oak doors and these are manual. But you approve the shop drawing. No, that's okay. I didn't issue a change order to change maple to oak. You still owe me <coughs> oak. I, I'm going to give you a, a lawyer answer, and I don't know the real answer to this. <laughs> but I, if I was representing the owner, I'd rather have my designer know early on that the contractor isn't intending to conform with the contract rather than wait till he shows up on the job site and goes, no, you know, take all that, take that wall down. That's not what I wanted. Uh, but you can get by that with a letter from the contractor that says, I intend to supply the products that are in your specification. Yeah, but most of our, con most of our design concepts are, there's three or four choices in every material your your or system you're specifying. You, the, the shop drawing tells you which one the contractor elected to proceed with and how they go together. So it's the only way we we'll see the Simple final answer. fit. <laughs> look, look at a set of contract documents from 120 years ago and how we were building buildings and the contract and, and the way we design buildings today. Yeah. How, how can you ago? design a lot of the stuff that your firm does without shop drawing? Get the concept done. You can't you can't afford to do the documents to build a building. You need shop drawings. I agree. But it is the last, I mean, it's where you see what was finally selected, how it comes together. And it's different. It's different. Keep that in your mind. Keep, you're not the first thought on how many shop drawings you ask for. You're not the first person. Oh. Now, that's a, that's a different question. That, that, that's, that's a different question. Yeah. Uh, I sometimes, you know, talk to my own people about, you don't need a shop drawing in everything. <laughs> you know, so. Steve made the comment earlier about you know, yeah, Steve, I, 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 sorry. I, yeah, yeah, okay. I, write, I write the specifications and I put in the shop drawings that I think they're going to want to prove the design that they're asking for. And I always tell them during your QA, QC review, if you don't want or you don't feel you need the shop yeah. drawing, we can line through it. Tell me you don't want it. Yeah. I will happily take it out of the spec. Yeah. And then we get the CA and they come up to me, why the hell am I getting so many damn shop drawings? Why the hell did you read my spec? <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole different question. Well, yeah. <laughs> <coughs> Michael, how are we doing? We're okay on time. Um, We're having fun. It's not morning. Everybody, everybody's like, it's not morning. <laughs> but, you know, yeah, you know, a couple more questions. Or minutes or something. Or something. Yeah. What's wrong with this statement? Don't worry about it now. We'll deal with it in shop blocks. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Sounds like you ran out of feet. It's a yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that. Uh, I've, I'm a spec writer, so I don't hear it anymore. But, but I've heard that statement in an architect. Don't worry about it now. We'll deal with it in shop drawings. What's wrong with that? <laughs> How do you? Yeah, that. Uh, <laughs> because see, that shoot the the design 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 design. Design. <laughs> How do you know, when you get the shop drawing, how do you know if it conforms to the design then? I don't know, I, you know, I guess it's pretty factually driven. But so it's a terrible statement. It, is. it sounds like a recipe for a lot of problems to me, but you, know, you guys know better than I do it's about that. My problem is, all I ever see are the things that go wrong. You know, <laughs> people are fighting with each other, so all these projects go smoothly and <coughs> the issues. I don't see enough of it. I wasn't looking at anybody specific. I don't see enough of those. <laughs> <laughs> it's not at this table. <laughs> no, not in this room. Okay, I have any other questions? I mean, I'd be happy to answer your question. I think we're getting yeah, go ahead, uh, wind down sign. Sure. Uh, there is, I'll just say that there is in the paper uh, 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 this short discussion about delegation of design, which happens and how that works, but whatever so I'd be happy to answer more questions or the discussion would be entirely different if we were talking about design build construction 
would it not? Uh, for the uh, contractual relationship part of the discussion, the production, it would be. The, but produ <laughs> the production and approval. Did someone bring a sheep to the food? <laughs> <laughs> That'd be for the production <laughs> and approval of shop drawings. Yeah. Uh, it would be only in that you would take the owner out of the equation. Unless you were doing everything in house, right. you would still have that between the, the builder and the designer that are part of the team. Right? I so. Yeah. I would say shop drawings. Well, having worked in design and build, we always did use shop drawings. Right. Because suppliers were third parties to our process. Right. So they had to bring proof to the table that they knew what we were talking about, even if it was contractor and architect agreeing together. It right. was always some level of communication required. Yeah, that's what I was trying to say. It just kind of really taking the owner out. So what kind of obligation do you really have when you specify uh, X amount to be submitted and it isn't submitted? Um, like, you know, you might have uh, four items, like a certificate for this and the drawings and the warranty and all this. Contractor doesn't submit all the pieces. Construction <coughs> proceeds. You approve a pay application. The work is in place. I mean, yeah. Okay. So, what happens if you don't insist on everything in that contract being submitted and approved and waived? Ninety-five percent of the time, nothing. Okay. Nothing happens. But if you're in that five percent, you got to sit down with the owner and explain to them why they are getting what they paid for because you let the contractor off the hook. So if you specify these are the criteria for shops, you've got to sit, <coughs> you've got to say, deliver it or let the owner know if they didn't. If you don't it. want it, don't specify. You know, that's kind of the, the yeah, that's exactly. right, kind of right. the point Steve was making is that, you know, you why put all that stuff in there? You have a responsibility to keep your client informed. So if the contractor's not informing you, you need to communicate that. They can decide in that form if that's their decision. Yeah, if they decide to let it slide, that's their decision. Then they get it in right. But yeah. I'll, I'll just turn that question on you a little bit, too. One of the questions that I always ask our PAs and PMs is Did you get the submittal schedule? Because that's a requirement, oh, too. That's like you never see that. Well, exactly. You never get the submittal schedule, but they're supposed to identify that in their schedule. And that then relieves you of the responsibility of timely review because you're not. Required at that point to you're supposed to do it in a timely manner. Right. Well, but instead of relief, it, 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 it excuses you, it, you a couple more days. Yeah. I'll give you that. <laughs> That's like another session. I mean, there's just so much in the front end that is spelled out that the contractor is supposed to do before construction starts, and it doesn't happen. And at least, I guess the designer's liable, so take it out. <clears throat> if it doesn't happen and you don't really think it's necessary, take it out. Yeah, absolutely. And if it's required, don't hit a pay application. Right. right. Yeah. Could we then get an approval schedule? You, well, that's what the submittal schedule is, technically. Yeah, I was going to say, you, 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 even without a schedule, it's reasonable. If they're delaying your work because of approval, it's an issue. Yes, sir. Just to you know, kind of reply to what you said, and this is CSI Dogma. Uh, submittals and the paperwork is every bit part of the contract as a brick or a beam or anything. It's tangible. And if you don't get it, you're perfectly justified in going to the contract. It's part of the contract. It's required by the contract. You're right. Okay, folks. Okay, thank you. Thank you.